I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Shahid Khan. He is Director of Medical Education, consultant, in physici consultant Physician in Elderly Medicine in Northeast Hertfordshire. He would like to share his topic on multi-pronged approach in medical education to improve patient safety. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Thanks very much for the invitation. I was thinking about safety, innovation, and the area I thought I'll be discussing would be international medical graduates. I'm a physician, full-time working physician, but my main interest is medical education. Over the next 10 minutes, I'll just be discussing about our future generation. People who are going to be taking from us will be taking over our roles in future. And a lot of them will be sitting on these chairs within the next few years. <coughs> when we talk about patient safety, everything we do is around patient safety. No matter what we are doing, it's surrounded by patient safety. This is the, the document promoting excellence whenever an outside team comes to my trust. This is the first document they put on the table. And if you look at it, two key themes, supporting the trainees and supporting the trainers, is one of the, uh, these are the two main issues they talk about. Health is a global market. It's a huge market. And I just referenced one of the, the reports from World Health Organization. Currently, there is deficit of 7.2 million in the international market. These are healthcare workers. This deficit is going to get worse. It will be 12.9 million in a few decades. So doctors are going to be a very limited resource, and we need to look after our doctors if we want to utilize this resource. Our healthcare system is in difficulty, partly because of staffing issues. In practically every trust up and down the country, we have rotor gaps. We don't enough, have enough doctors. I won't even talk about other health professionals, nurses, paramedical staff. I'll concentrate just on the doctors. Demand for international medical graduates is sky high, and it will get, get there, there'll be more need for international medical graduates in future, particularly after Brexit. There'll be a lot of opportunity for international medical graduates to come over. By definition, these are the doctors who qualified outside uh, Britain or outside Europe, European economic area. And these doctors, they have really set the foundations of NHS when it first started, and particularly in 1950s and 1960s. And some of the uh, uh, speakers before me, they have actually alluded to it, how things were developed. Currently, we have just over 67,000 doctors who are international medical graduates. And yesterday, one of the talk uh, suggested there are about 14,000 international medical graduates from Pakistan. So it's a huge, huge number. And NHS has saved a lot of money by employing these doctors because they haven't paid any money in training these doctors, but they have benefited from them. And nearly 1.5 billion has been saved by, by NHS just by employing these doctors. And these doctors are contributing significantly to date uh, in relation to medicine in the uh, in United Kingdom. Difficult slide to read, but what it shows is that although the numbers are decreasing, and uh, that's the first, first column, uh, but there are still a lot of doctors in their 50s and particularly between 30 and 50. But a lot of the doctors working between the age of 30 and 50 they are not in, uh, they're not on specialist registers or not, on, uh, uh, not in training. And then we see these headlines. We see headlines about foreign doctors being below British standards and foreign doctors not really up to mark. And this thing blows up from time to time. And I'm sure most of you would have seen these headlines. So is there any truth in it? Is there any background to it? And I think some of the talks which we had earlier, uh, 
particularly uh, uh, Professor, Professor Salim's talk was very interesting in the sense that he set the scene for my talk. Because if a trainee is coming from those circumstances, coming over to UK, working in a very different environment, they will find it difficult. So if you look at the evidence, overseas medical graduates, they are much more likely to end up in front of GMC or to refer to NCAS. They perform less well in higher exams. As examiner for Royal College, I see it practically every year. I've seen international medical graduates taking out a pin out of their pocket because they have never seen neurotips before and trying to examine, uh, examine patients' limbs. They don't do very well, even when they're in the education system. ARCP outcomes are poor for international medical graduates. And high percentage of trainees in difficulty. As director of medical education, I have registered for all my trainees in difficulty. And significant number of those are international medical graduates. So complaints for international medical graduates, twice as high as local graduates, higher than European graduates. And most at risk are inter international medical graduates who are over the age of 50, or international medical graduates who are general practitioners between the age of 30 and 50. My experience is most international medical graduates, they find, uh, find it difficult within the first two to five years of their coming to UK. That's the time they usually end up in difficulty with GMC. So how do we support international medical graduates? A lot of them come from areas, areas of conflict. And we previously uh, uh, looked at some of the pictures uh, from Peshawar and uh, from uh, 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 northern areas. And when they come to UK working in NHS, they are in a very complex system. Uh, and they find it, find it very daunting. They are not prepared. And that's one of my reasons for raising this as an issue, that we need to make sure they are better prepared before they actually come over to the United Kingdom. There's a lot of information available. There are a lot of resources available. And that's my request to the colleagues back home, that they need to support these trainees, make them better prepared. They themselves have been trained over here. They understand the system better. So if they are not, not aware of the, the roles, the responsibilities, they find it difficult regarding the infrastructure over here, they find it difficult to understand the legal system over here, they will end up in trouble. It's a new culture, different ways of educating, different ways of training. Even we find it difficult at times because every year or two, there is something new coming in in medical education and we have to update ourselves. Language is a big challenge. Cultural awareness is a big challenge. They don't understand uh, how English language, how it changes the meaning just by emphasizing on something different. A lot of them have personal health issues, and they keep it quiet. Uh, property is another issue, which they get into trouble not knowing the system and uh, the legal requirements in this country. So approach to support. Number one, we need to recognize it. And in East of England and in London deaneries, there's a big emphasis because we need to look after these trainees. We need to look after these doctors. If we don't look after them, we are going to lose them. And as it's an international market now, there is dearth of doctors. We need to get these doctors to work with us. And it's not just uh, teaching them communication. It's teaching them in clinical context. It needs to be how things are done and what th things are, uh, needs to be done and why, this why. We need to explain to them why we're doing it. And we need to involve professionals from all different areas. We need to have inductions, not just about policies and guidelines and procedures. We need to include cultural uh, induction within it. And this is something which I'm trying very hard to uh, uh, preach to my colleagues in, uh, uh, in East of England, that that's a very important aspect if we need to make sure that these trainees will work, work well. We need to look at their needs, unmet expectations. They came over here to become neurosurgeons or invasive cardiologists. 
and they end up doing glaucoma, they can't find the right job for them. So they, they need to be taught how to progress in the system, and they need to be supported. And sometimes they need time to actually pick up not just the new technology, but unlearn some of the old patterns that they've accumulated over years. Communication, particularly with uh, some of the, uh, I wouldn't say specifically about Pakistan, but from some of the other countries, I've come across trainees when they say yes, they turn their head in opposite direction. And it's very confusing, even for us. So for, for other colleagues, it becomes very, very difficult. So until, unless you understand the social background of the trainee, it becomes difficult to support them. And nonverbal communication is as important as verbal communication. We need to reflect on our own assumptions and bias. We need to make sure that they are, the trainees are treated fairly, they are assessed, they are monitored, and they are trained. And we need to cultivate this cultural competence, both at individual level and at organizational level. And I think this is our responsibility, particularly in the United Kingdom, to make sure that our organizations have this organizational uh, cultural competence. Otherwise, our trainees will be at loss. So action plans, we need to train our trainees. We need to induct them beyond trust induction, not just around what the policies are, but we need to actually give them cultural induction as well. We need to make sure that we are up to their expectations. But, but we ne also need to look at the other side consultants, colleagues who are delivering the service, we also need to make sure that their expectations are met. So we need to be in between. Supporting the trainees and supporting the trainers make both sides aware of the difficulties and problems and provide support. And social integration is part of it. We need to look at ARCP outcomes. We need to look at our trainees and see if ARC out outcomes are not good, how we can support them. Professional support units are excellent. If you have a training difficulty or if a trainee is finding it difficult, in most areas there are uh, professional support units and we, we need to benefit from them. Any issues, conduct, capability or health can be referred to PSU. Quite a few times I've come across young doctors from Pakistan and from other countries as well. They don't have any trade union representation. When they get into difficulty, there is nobody to support them. They don't have BMA membership, they don't have MDU membership, and when the bills come, they come in thousands, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, can't afford it. So they need to be encouraged to have these memberships. A lot of them don't even have a general practitioner, and it only, trans it only becomes uh, uh, into light when you actually deal with these problems. So we need to encourage them to have the right memberships and have general practitioners. There is a lot of information available, and there are several colleagues that I know of who are trying to increase the profile of this issue, how to support international medical graduates. There are online courses, there are workshops which are run by GMC, there are uh, scenarios based uh, tools online, and professional support units. I'll stop now. And I think all I've tried to do is to provide a little bit of information in 10 minutes. Some of the responsibilities is to myself and colleagues who are working over here. And I think responsibility also lies with colleagues back home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time for one question, please. worked with a lot of international medical graduates and uh, should that not be compulsory from the GMC rather than just, you know, a uh, uh, voluntary exercise? Yeah, it is a voluntary exercise. There, there are several courses run every month, but I think it's really up to the trainees to be advised to take up those offers. I think it would be very difficult for GMC to make everything mandatory. Yeah, that lady, next.
Trades Union. I don't think that is, I'm not aware, is something like appraisal um, available in Pakistan? Is that something that medical practitioners have to do? Appraisal? No concept of appraisal. That's a very simple thing to do. But I would like to come over here. Appraisal is a relatively new thing over here as well, so I wouldn't criticize Pakistan. I'm not criticizing yes. at all, so at it's all. Only, it's only six years old here as well. But it gives, again, um, a structure to the individual guidance. That if, until you don't make it mandatory, you will not do it. OK. I'll, I'll give you a small example. The Joint Board for the Three Royal Colleges they're actually setting up training programs for trainees. Mm -hmm. And they have set them up in several countries in Malta, Ireland experience. And they are taking all this information to those countries. So the trainees will have exactly the same training, same portfolio, same appraisal, same sort of ARCP re uh, and revalidation yeah. as we have over here. So I think in uh, there are a lot of other countries, I think India and Dubai are picking that up. So this is going to expand, and I think appraisal will come in. Yeah, no, appraisal Dr. isn't Amjitshik. something that doctors Dr. are happy Amjitshik. here either. Thank you very much. Uh, Shahid, uh, I will um, congratulate you for a very comprehensive uh, talk. Now, uh, have you ever considered discouraging Pakistani IMGs? They are the cream of the society. They are the cream of, uh, you know, uh, uh, chaps out there who are coming here, and then they are uh, abused and uh, not given the proper place. Uh, there was, <clears throat> a few years ago in 2006, there was a policy announced by NHS ministers that they will reciprocate. You know, they are saving 1.5 billion uh, pounds, as you say. Have you ever considered taking it on through this platform so that they can reciprocate by you know, giving uh, uh, paid or non-paid leaves uh, for the consultants to go there and work there, one. Secondly, uh, uh, I've been working here and in Pakistan for the last 34 years. I have seen only one doctor from mainland China. And they were far, far behind us in 70s and 80s. And where they are now. Do you think that you know, by bringing them out here, are we improving a lot of Pakistanis out there? I'm part of it, you know. I'm, I, I'm not, you know. I'm uh, half, you know. I'm uh, at fault myself, you know. I've yeah. worked here, so I uh, can't consider myself, you know, uh, saying and you know, uh, criticizing other people. I'm part of it. But have you ever considered this? Yeah. I think if you look around yesterday and today, a lot of very eminent, very experienced colleagues actually came over here, got trained, and went back. And they were the people who actually improved the standard of education and training in Pakistan and what we see now. And I'm really grateful to senior colleagues who came just before me, how they have created the medical system over there from practically nothing. So yes, a lot of people have gone back and they've taken the expertise and knowledge and applied over there. Your question about will we get people to go back and work, I think a lot of people are doing it on an individual basis. One of my colleagues who's got a charity hospital being run, he sits over here, works over here, collects funds over here, runs a charity hospital in Pakistan. I think there are a lot of pockets of good work which are not really recognized, and I think this platform is ideal for us to share those experiences. And if I say I want to go to Pakistan and work within voluntary section, my medical, my medical uh, uh, colleagues or medical director will have no objection to it. And I'm sure it will be the same for most of us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.